point out that I'm the only one that put love and education in the title. <laughs> because I want to talk about how we can love our students in ways that doesn't involve knowledge. And so part of my talk is going to be to try to discern what knowledge is and what the role of a teacher is. Let me start by showing you the only statistic that I'm going to put up here. Um, I want to point out that the purple line is the cost of health care over the last 30 years. Health care. Take a minute and think about what the political state has been in this country over the last eight years, trying to figure out what the role of government is in health care. And then look at the blue line, because that's the skyrocketing cost of higher education in the United States. And if you think that there was a debate on health care, there is a day of reckoning coming for higher education. We need in higher education to find ways to make education as accessible and as affordable as possible. I'm not sure exactly what the impediments are, but I, I know my mom, who's an elementary school teacher, likes to tell <clears throat> kind of a joke. Um, she says, education is about love, and people choose to be teachers because of love. Elementary teachers love children. And high school teachers, well, they love their discipline a lot. College teachers, they tend to love themselves. <laughs> and I think part of this is because we have a relationship with knowledge that we need to unpack. Technology is changing how we think. Nicholas Carr has become one of our most prominent critics of technology. And he has a new book that just came out a couple weeks ago called The Glass Cage about how technology encircles us. Um, but there's, and really the, the Atlantic Monthly ran an article that um, when I was just starting out in education, uh, this was in the 80s. The computer delusion was about the, the myth that we should put computers in every classroom. And we're still having those debates about where technology lies. But there's lots of books, lots of critics, lots of pundits who say that technology isn't good or bad. It's changing the way we think. Socrates, for goodness sake, was worried that the written word would ruin education. Technology isn't going to ruin education, but technology is going to change the way we interact with the world. Monks, 10th century. The way that religious texts were transcribed was to have someone sit in the front of a fairly large classroom, read, and have the other monks transcribe, slowly, dutifully. And you create texts, you, you Xerox machines. Walk around a college classroom today. That's what you're going to see in way too many of them. Students are transcribing. This notion that what's in my head can get into their notebooks through the act of transcription is faulty at best, pernicious at worst. I think it ruins the opportunities we have to connect with our students, to show how much we love them as individuals, and how we want them to grow. This is knowledge today. It's everywhere. It is not the purview of the monastery. And I do worry that college teachers right, view themselves as academics. They view themselves as controlling the knowledge. But that knowledge 
isn't their purview anymore. Students, I, I, I was giving a talk this morning and a student Googled something to check me on some facts. That's, that's what's going on inside our classrooms in the best college classrooms. And that's facilitated by moving knowledge out of the classroom. I think we should be in the wisdom business. And I like the New York Times crossword puzzle, so I gave credit for where I found it. Um, I think we want our students to make knowledge their own. They want to take what we have, and they need to put it in a context that works for them. So a little theory. Bloom's taxonomic classification is about the different levels of cognitive thought. Some of my favorite studies in higher education survey faculty who say, I want my students to think critically. And then those same researchers look at the exams that those teachers give, and the exams are on the bottom two levels of this, which have nothing to do with critical thinking. They have to do with simple recall of facts. So where do we move in higher education? We take the knowledge, we take the understanding lists, definitions. We move them outside a class. We make short videos, and I am not talking about making hour-long videos that we <laughs> torture our students and require them to watch because they're not going to watch them if they're hour-long and we expect them to sit in front of a computer and watch us lecture. What we need to do is create what the most important pieces are, make podcasts, make screencasts. We have the technology to do this. And then what we do is when we come into class, we do different things. We change the dynamic because students already come with that knowledge. And so we do things like mock trials. We do things like debates. We give them worksheets that have diagrams and we let them solve some things. We use clickers where students answer. The top left here, is, the top, you're right, is um, a clicker classroom. Students sit in groups. I have faculty come by these classes and say, where's the teacher? Because the teacher is wandering around, along with other peer mentors, trying to help facilitate learning. These students in that classroom have had knowledge before the class. And then during class, they're spending time trying to make sense of it. One of my favorite pictures is the alpaca down here. Um, because in an upper level physiology course, um, one of my colleagues had students do a talk on an animal and relate it back to the human. And a student said, well, can I bring in an alpaca? That's a good use of face-to-face -face time because it's, it's hard to pet an alpaca virtually. We still, we want students smiling in our classes. I think we can have fun. I have way too many colleagues that think education should be a slog. I, I had to address this in my fourth year tenure review because I got a call from the dean saying, your evaluations for organic chemistry are too high. If students like this class, you're not challenging them. <laughs> I had to submit my grade distribution, I had to submit my syllabi, I had to submit exams, and I got a call three weeks later saying, we still don't understand it, but whatever you're doing, go ahead. <laughs> we can change higher education, and it's going to come through technology, we're going to make it more efficient, we're going to make it more affordable, and we're going to do it while we love our students even more.